Welcome, everybody, to Extra Time Driven by Continental Tire from the AT&T 5G Virtual Studios and actually hosted from New York, New York. David <laughs> Goss here alongside Matt Doyle and Kaylin Carr. Andrew Weeby is no longer with us. No, I'm just kidding. Andrew Weeby's not here today, but every once in a while, just to keep the swag of the show alive, we have to actually host the show from New York City just mm. so that we can like maintain our residency here as a New York-based show and not a Midwest-based show. Is that Kansas? Yeah, Kansas is, is like right okay. smack dab in the Midwest. So yeah, we, we have the New York, New York energy. I think even Kalen's back in New York, right? Yeah. No longer traveling the world. <laughs> where where do you guys think I go? I went on. I don't one. know, man. Like I says the dude follow like, you on Instagram. And uh, you're, uh, you're actually, city. I did go like, to Philly really? this weekend. Yeah, there you go. Warren Craval's birthday. So shout out to Warren. You only travel to places with peas though. Philly, Portugal. Yeah. So yeah. either you're headed for Portland next. Ooh. Or it's going to be a long flight to the Philippines. I could go to Portland. Portland sounds fun. Maybe ma- people aren't feeling so great today, but. Uh, yeah, very true. And we, <laughs> it we'll was get a... to that in just a moment. Uh, appreciate that, Kalen. But it's a city with goals. You love goals. So I do. it could work for you. So we'll get to all of the wildness that was MLS over the course of this weekend. It was awesome to watch. A lot of fun. Obviously, we'll talk our favorite young players. We got a conversation coming about contenders and tiers and all of that as we love to you know, parse words and complain about everything that doesn't matter while the teams go out and actually play and, and put together points and move on. And of course the mailbag as well on MLS soccer.com. We've got Doyle's column as always on Monday, you can see a tribute video that Dax McCarty's former teammates put together and current teammates for his 400th MLS league appearance. And then Sam Jones has a piece celebrating Joseph Martinez's long awaited home goal. I think it was, it's been two years yeah. since he scored at Mercedes Benz stadium. Let's start with a shout out to the winner of our extra time fantasy league. That's Bahe Khan Trenza. Who knows if I said it right, but it's a name. So I can't be wrong. Uh, who put up 108 points and held off star Wars, a new who hope to win the week by captain Daniel Shallowy, who we'll talk about in a moment. Let's start with some big action coming up, which is we are like a week and a half away from the MLS all-star game in 2021. It's Wednesday, August 25th, 9 PM Eastern time on FS1, 2DN, TSN, and Tevi, ah, which apparently, by the way, TSN ripped me for questioning Tejan on a clip that I can't get access to in the United States. So I'm very pumped about that as well. <laughs> I always love a good TSN broadcast. We've got the skills challenge coming up the Tuesday before the All-Star game. So that one will be August 24th, 9 p.m. Eastern time on FS1, 2DN, TSN, and Tevi, ah, as well. Uh, that one presented by at t 5G. There are still tickets available if you're in the L.A. area, which... I think might be awesome to go to because this is a studied group of players. That's going to be a part of this skills challenge. Some added events as well. We've got the young studs, Ricardo Pepe, who's going to be a part of this going up against a bunch of Liga MX all-stars. And Pepe, when asked about it, was like, yeah, it's just cool to be around everyone. It's just cool to be a part of it. And it's like, dude, don't be humble. I feel like, (laughs) you know, that some of the veterans are going to be like taking it easy. Pepe's going bike kicks. Pep MLS Skills Challenge uh, MVP of 2021. Where is this taking place? Where Where is the Skills Challenge this year? Oh, Kalen always has to come in with a question that I didn't know. Bank of California Stadium. Okay, so it's in the stadium. Okay, yeah. that, that's cool. The- uh, yeah, th- I feel like pe- people may have forgotten about, you know, it's been so long. We had to sit out a year, but the Skills Challenge was awesome. one of the highlights for me uh, from the last All-Star and like a really cool new thing and i think you know when i think about all-star games i went to uh i was telling you guys before i went to the nba all-star dunk contest before uh in houston which was you guys were giving me a hard time <laughs> <laughs> you were like where were you sitting down by the court side i was like i was at the top uh, let me tell you let me tell you if you watch the the 2011 all-star uh dunk contest it goes trace mcgrady vince carter Kalen Carr, Kevin Garnett yeah. sitting on the yeah. sideline. I was so high <laughs> up. The lineup. I was too embarrassed to bring a date. So, uh, <laughs> anyways, but the uh, the skill back to the skills challenge. Uh, it was. Uh, I mean, you get you get really close. You can get close to the players. You can get close to the experience and like. It, you know, it's an all star event. So you, all the stars are coming out. And when I saw the list released of the uh, skills challenge, I mean, even the Liga and Me- Mekis teams are. Zambu. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Zambu was built in a lab for a skills challenge. Yeah. He was not running anywhere and he could do anything with the ball that he wants. But it does turn a little bit into uh, 
like it can turn into a little bit of an endurance challenge because you're you're throwing like side they do the cross and volley and you're throwing side volleys you're taking balls out of the air uh it's not just a chill crossbar challenge thing so i think youth could be a smart pick here i like i like the peppy sleeper pick to steal the show I will say from the last skills challenge, one of the coolest moments was Ache Ache, who was at Atleti, who was part of it as the opponent, hanging with Jonah Dos Santos and Vela, like them going against each other, joking around about it, enjoying it, Nani there. And it's like, yeah, sometimes it's cool to watch really famous, impressive people just be normal people and have fun and enjoy it. Um, And this event's going to be cool. Goalkeepers are now added in. That wasn't a part of it last time. So right now it's Matt Turner and Pedro Gallese. And Alfredo Talavero and Nahu Guzman, who has been one of the most entertaining goalkeepers in the world over the last few years at Tigres. I can't imagine what the hair is going to be for this, as well as uh, what he's going to do on the field. So tickets available still for both the skills challenge and the game. And this is the game we've I've been waiting for for 15 years, right? Like the All-Star game is fun. It's cool. Um, but this is unique to soccer and this is unique to our region and this is what I wanted to see was the best in league MX versus the best in MLS. Yeah. It felt like the previous format of the all-star game had kind of run its course. It It was exciting when it started. Exactly. And, and, you know, we, we, we just have so much better access to, you know, the great teams in the world, you know, whether it's when Chelsea came or Manchester United or Atleti as it came two years ago. And like this, there's just a little more juice. Because it is the the best of MLS versus the best of Liga MX, and like that's what you know, it's still a hill that the league has got to climb. And granted, it's an All Star game; it's not the same thing as CCL or Campeones Cup or Leagues Cup, um, but it still feels like it's going to matter a little bit. So yeah, I'm jacked for it, and I'm usually not one who is <laughs> particularly excited about the All Star game. I'm going to be dialed in for this one. I think yeah. you also appreciate the attacking stars from Living MX and not a Diego Simeone team in a quote unquote entertainment yeah. event. <laughs> <laughs> the entertainment was watching him manage from the oh, side. Man. Yeah. 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 Just sitting right behind him. Just he was going he was not treating it like an all-star match. So I, I respected that. But yeah, I think I think Chicharito and Vela will, you know, steal the headline the, the uh you know, the headlines because of their history with the national team. But um, even when you look at the, like Zella Rayan and Rui Diaz and players that played in Liga Mekis and coming up yeah, to, to sure. MLS too, there's there's a lot more crossover, not just between the competitions, um, I guess, between the lines, but also with the transfer and the way that, you know, both leagues are basically picking off uh, talent from each other. Also, just to finish on this with the news that David Ochoa has, has, you know, officially joined the Mexican National Team Federation, there's rumors around Julian Araujo as well. If Ricardo Pepe crushes this all-star game, the 2DN broadcast will melt down. So I'm here for those numbers. I'm here for that energy. I love Pepe so much. Whatever he decides, he's got me in his corner, and I've never rooted for. I probably wouldn't root for the Mexican national team. I would just root for him to score a ton of goals when he's not playing the U.S., but I don't want to get blamed for this. So we <laughs> we support him in whatever decision he makes. Uh, and now let me take over my full Andrew Wiebe narrative fun zone responsibilities, and I want to make it open-ended. I want this to be inclusive for all of us. So I'm going to say that this was a weekend of pure MLS chaos, and I want you guys to choose your favorite chaos moments of the weekend. And Doyle, let's begin with you. I mean, you know you know exactly where we're going. We're going, we're going up to Montreal for, <laughs> for the, the you know, CF Montreal <laughs> versus the Red Bulls. And for 90 minutes, this was like a fairly normal game. Right. The only like interesting thing was that Montreal couldn't, you know, they were playing really well and they couldn't quite put it away. Carlos Coronel was having, a, you know, made a couple of very good saves. I think there was some frustration building, but it felt like a normal game. And then a minute and a half, I think, into stoppage yeah, time. Yeah, like the 91st. Bjorn Johnson, good friend of the show, um, you know, gets loose sort of down the left for Montreal and – you know, he's dribbling into the box and looking for a pullback. And Amro Tarek dives in and has his arm flailing <laughs> behind him. Um, to me, it's stone cold penalty. 100% penalty. Yeah. That's what was called. Um, he almost now, had time to lift it up. He yeah, hit him with a change yeah. up. Really <laughs> slow roller. Yeah. And, and now we got to, you know, a, it's a 1-1 game. Now there's a penalty into stoppage time. And like, okay, if you're – 
a long time Red Bulls fan, you probably have an idea of how this is going to end. <laughs> but bear in mind that Montreal have been, I think, kind of cursed in MLS as well. And we saw this because as soon as the penalty was given, our good friend Bjorn and Mason Toy, who we love, started arguing about who was going to take the penalty kick, which we all, which we always love. Always which we, love. oh God, I, I adore it. And I like, I actually tweeted about it as it was happening. I was like, they were just awarded a penalty, but now they're arguing. And this usually <laughs> only ends one way. And there's like a great shot of Georgi Mihailovic sort of standing between the two of them. Like, <laughs> like, yeah, like uh, and like, I think the, the, the audio caught Mason toy saying like, give me the ball, give me the ball. Bjorn did not give him the ball, and he took the penalty, and Coronel saved it. And it looked like the Red Bull, like he celebrated, the whole Red Bull, his team celebrated. It was going to be a massive road point. And the game did not restart for a while afterwards. In like maybe 60 seconds, the referee goes over to the the sideline, takes a look, makes the VAR signal. Coronel had come off the line. Like, okay. That's pretty Metro right there. Um, <laughs> so now Bjorn has, missed, Bjorn has missed the penalty. Mason Toy, of course, who is the designated penalty taker for this team and should have taken the first one, uh, steps up to the spot. And he does what I consider to be kind of a BS run-up where uh, he pauses before he puts down his plant foot, and that pause causes Coronel to come off the line. Saves the shot, but it goes directly to VAR, and they do it all over again. Back to you know, back for Montreal to take the third penalty. We're in like five minutes of this so far. <laughs> yeah. Montreal, uh, Victor Wanyama, the DP captain of the team, steps up. Short run up, no pause. Takes an absolutely terrible penalty right down the middle that goes directly through Coronel's hands. 2-1 Montreal. Um, may, like, uh, I don't want to say it's a season-saving win for Montreal, but they absolutely needed this one to stay in the playoff hunt. Uh, for the Red Bulls, there's now one win in 10 games from them. They are on the lowest points-per-game pace, uh, third lowest in, in club history, whether it's Red Bulls or, or Metro Stars. They are on you know pace to miss the playoffs badly. Um and they haven't missed the playoffs since 2009. Uh, and this felt like, I mean, their season summarized. It was it was chaos. And they're, I mean, there's just no explaining what happened. It was, it was like, I, I have a, still have a bunch of good Red Bull fan friends. And my DMs and texts were blowing up. These people are miserable right now. Just absolutely miserable. And it's, under- and it's understandable as well. Brutal. Uh, I mean, the only thing I would say, Cornell, you see a lot of goalkeeper. He starts on the line each time. And you've seen a lot of goalkeepers now, I've noticed, stepping up. behind the line mm-hmm. to begin to allow yourself that little jump forward. So when you then spring to action, you have that little wiggle room to be able to launch from there. Because you feel for goalkeepers, they're already at a disadvantage in a penalty kick situation, right? But then now it's being watched what the you know a, a microscope um literally to to see it and i think that by the letter of the law by the rule it was the correct call on the field i do think that it is difficult especially when the uh the takers are allowed to pause and run up and like slow down <laughs> and with all of the theatrics that you see now which are essentially trying to bait the goalkeeper into d- moving or showing their hand early so they can go a different direction um so that's i think Cornell, when he takes a look at that, starting behind the line is going to be the way to go. Um, but I, I do wonder if they'll adjust the rules to allow like some of the craziness. I mean, it, it didn't really in this case, it didn't really affect it because Toy missed. But um, <laughs> you feel for the goalkeepers. I, I normally don't feel that way <laughs> as a striker. But I do appreciate that we're in an MLS atmosphere where you have Shet Messing on the call, a famous goalkeeper, and then the next day Tony Miola on the Chicago Fire. And Tony Miola's point was: if you miss twice. From the PK spot, I don't care where I'm standing. You don't get to take it again. <laughs> uh, which I could kind of understand. My I mean, that's, is, that's playground rules right there. For, for sure. sure. I also don't think you should be able to change the shooter. Like, this is your thing now. You missed. 
he was off the line. Now it's on Bjorn Johnson to figure out how to score oh, it. I don't point. think you should be allowed to just take another person out, but it was wild the entire scenario. I've um, long thought that he, whoever like whoever gets fouled should have to take the penalty anyways. But maybe that's just because I couldn't get on a pen otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, Kalen, we're, we're, did you often draw them though? Yeah, I got yeah, definitely, yeah. Good, good, quick feet, good, yeah. quick feet. Uh, the Kevin Paredes of the previous generation, Kalen Carr over here. But if you've been willing to take a date to the All Star Game, then you'd be a guy who would be able to steal a penalty kick. That's the difference. <laughs> it's all mental. I um, probably would have lost to. Anyways, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the Red Bull for the Red Bulls. Uh, I thought Mark Fishkin put it well on Twitter. He said that this is, will be the worst they've had in the Red Bull Arena era. Right. So yep. you can quote unquote call it the modern era for New York Red Bulls from Montreal. Um, you mentioned how big this was. You could see uh, Sunisi Ibrahim came off the bench, scored, and Sam Piet was on the field celebrating as that ball went in the net. And like you could feel the energy and emotion still coursing through this team. And this yep. was kind of the scenario we talked about preseason of like stick together, be a young group, and then come home. And now they're starting to get that bump and get that energy. And so they are currently in the playoff spots, which is pretty exciting to see. Yeah, they can't drop points like this, yeah. right? Like this was this was des- because they're not they're not good enough to go on the road and, and consistently win now in the in, you know the the meat of the season when teams are playing better and sort of shaking out where you understand exactly how you want to implement the manager's tactics and all of that. Like Montreal, they're they're like they have talent. They they do, and they they have some, I think, clarity of vision and with uh, with Wilfred Nancy, but it's still a team that that is not, they're not suited at this point to just go on the road and make up for a bad performance at home by by getting three points, basically anywhere at this point. So they absolutely needed this, and and you're right, like seeing the way they celebrated, like there there's obviously some belief coming through this team, and the other thing is like there's just. The talent is sort of, I mean, just it's improving, right? Like Kamal Miller has been better this year than I think anybody thought he was really going to be. Um, Mihailovic. Yeah, you, I'm a Kamal <laughs> Miller guy. You are. Know, you've always been. Mihailovic has been excellent. I, I know Toy was was miserable in front of goal this game, but he had, I thought it was his best all around game as a center forward. Um, Joaquin Torres. Uh, a little bit selfish in the final third, but he he brings something different in the they attack. Need it. It, it's just someone yeah. who wants the ball in those moments. It takes pressure off a toy and a Mihailovic who probably can't do it for 90 full minutes of just pure chance creation. Yeah, well, I mean, so he's... He, Mihailovic is, is like a better chance creator when the game's not necessarily running through him, mm-hmm. when he's able to like find his spots and, and like pick the ball up in pockets of space and hit that last pass rather than like just eliminating defenders off the dribble and stuff like that. But like, it was it was huge for Montreal. I still am not necessarily convinced that they're going to make the playoffs, but they're going to be in the, in the fight until the, the very end. And they are a lot more fun to watch than they have been in a long, long time. And I think that's a win for this season oh, yeah. for them, if that's the case. Uh, Kalen, let's move on to your chaos moment of the weekend, <clears throat> weeby narrative, whatever we call things on this show, which I normally don't pay attention to. Well, it was la- last night, uh, uh, Portland, Seattle, just eight goals, <laughs> uh, just uh, some incredible goals at that, too. I think this was the the 113th meeting between these two teams. So it's so much history, uh, best rivalry in MLS, all due respect to Toronto and Montreal, which uh, popped off a couple of years back. But uh, I think as far as consistency, history, um, and then even just as far as, I guess, relevance, when you look at how these two sides have um, really gone through the playoffs in the past five or six years or so that it's uh you know it's appointment viewing and i think you know we got we got to see almost too much of it last year and it was all different because there was no fans um and there was the regional rivalries and stuff that happened but this one felt like had some anticipation and hype to it and boy did it live up to the billing because uh i mean two two twos going back and forth um, I thought Portland had better stretches for a while, but overall, I just felt that Seattle looked like the team that had played in more matches like that. I don't know how else to describe it. They just seemed more savvy in those moments where just getting on the right end of things. I mean, there was the, just the small plays that can start sort of compound itself and um, 
go from there. Or Alex Rodon, Roldan just kind of has that extra little bit of patience to take the touch to the end yeah. line and then whip it across. And then it really it came down to just these ruthless killers in the box. <laughs> and um, I mean, uh, Rui Diaz now, I think back on top of the golden boot, uh, that the one right after Portland scored where he gets the set piece and just smokes it was huge. And then Freddie Montero has been one of the signings of the season. Um, and just, we're, we're going to talk about strikers. I think we're going to talk to Bobby Wood and just how important it is to find the right fit and place and system. And Freddie coming back, I think has been huge for, um, for Seattle this year. And, um, he took he took both of his chances very well. So, uh, just uh, and then yeah, I didn't even is mention the Madrona goal. Is that what we're going to call the second Freddie Montero goal? Oh, he took that chance very well. <laughs> and in a normal one? game, that, or the first time, the, the second goal where he cuts where he inside comes in on his left foot, his left, oh. and he absolutely smokes it. Like yeah. in a normal game, that would be the by far the best goal. It's like <laughs> barely cracking the top three in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I didn't even get to the Madronda finish, which was just like, which was probably the goal of the year. <laughs> <laughs> insane. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I uh, Seattle. I think a statement win for them to say, and, and I've been saying New England, New England, New England. Well, you know, Seattle fell a little bit down on the list, but now you see Ladero back into the team. Um, you see Roldan back from the national team. Stephen Fry is supposed to be coming back, I think, at the end of the month, um, potentially. And now they've gotten experience for some younger players coming through. Um, yeah, Tensio they, comes off the bench in a game like this. Which yeah, they've got depth. Reality. Uh, Nuhu hopefully comes back at some point. He's been out for the last couple months. So you start to look around and you say, mm, this Seattle team is scary. They look scary right now. And um, I, I think they might be the best team. I, th- I, I, I think they are the best team. Yep, and yep. it's because, like, I think... Oh, uh, you're about to get some social yeah. media love from the New England Revolution. They, uh, yeah, shout out Willie. Uh, <laughs> I just think they're, 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 they're top end when they have these guys healthy. Um, and, again, they, they're still... They're not yet all completely healthy and whole, but we saw in the second half what, what it looks like with Ladero out there. Yeah. Um, and we know that they have the ability to mix and match and keep him rested. I mean, we saw it in this game. Kellen Rowe got the first 45 minutes, and he was really good. Um, and then they're able to just take him off at halftime, change the shape a little bit to more of a 3-5-2 rather than the 3-4-3. And um, it looks even better. And, like, Ladero helps establish uh, – you know, more of a rhythm in central midfield and obviously has a little bit of magic that can otherwise be missing from this team. Uh, you know, both fullbacks or wingbacks, because it's a, it's a back five, just like dominating their opponents 1v1. Like Alex Roldan j- just like ending <laughs> Claudio Bravo on, on that first goal. Like just finding solutions, not only for games against the Timbers, where if like they, the Timbers leave the door open and kind of dare you to beat them defensively. And like, that's how Seattle wins by four, but doing the same thing against Tigris earlier in the week, we saw how MLS teams kind of struggled this week this past week against league MX clubs. Well, Seattle was playing against Tigris who are the team of the decade in North America. And they beat him three nil. They smoked them. Um, I don't think any other team from what I've seen this year has that gear. And they certainly don't have the depth that Seattle has shown throughout the season. I thought it was interesting on the broadcast, uh, John Strong and Stu Holden talking about Brian Schmetzer discussing the League's Cup game and how they sort of looked at it as a, because they've been in a slump of sorts, as a way to sort of like restart and kickstart them. And it worked out well for them. I just wanted to read this email from Rafa in Bologna, Italy, real quick, who said, I wrote to you in April, expected Freddie Montero to exceed expectations this season and that he'd be among the best, if not the best, intra-league signings of the year. And so far, he's proven it. He went to Seattle on a free transfer on a league minimum salary, yet despite injuries, he's been incredibly productive, has six goals, with three of them being against Seattle's arch rivals, Portland, and three assists in just over 700 minutes, not to mention his league's cup goal against Tigres. He looks just great as a second striker next to Rui Diaz in the 3-5-2 that you mentioned, Doyle. We hear all the time about the Roldan brothers, Rui Diaz or Xiao Paolo, and deservedly so, but I believe he also does a ton and needs some love from extra time. So Freddie Montero getting that love, and you just look at that that goal that he scores, and they're on the break, 
and Roldan's making a run and Rui Diaz is making a run and Jao Paulo's running with pace and Portland's back line is just scrambling. And then you think about him playing at Vancouver the last few years and it would have been Freddie with the yeah. ball trying to break and no one making runs around him that a defense has to really deal with. So he's enjoying life. It's been good for him. Let's talk about Portland real quick because this was also one of the healthier and more complete squads we've seen from them in a while. Blanco's first start in 11 months. Claudio Bravo's back from the Argentine Olympic team. Zuparic back, Mabiala, um, both the Chara brothers. This was as n- no, no, um, I can't remember his name, center for Nishkoda. Which he came in late. He came in yeah. late. And probably be a while before he's a starter, but outside of that, and Williamson, a fairly healthy squad. I, I will is anyone say that, worried about Portland? I will say that the, the goalkeeper situation is a massive downgrade from, from Steve yeah. Clark without being too unkind to the, the, the young man who was in, in that uh, last night. Because he, he, other people would like to be more unkind. In yes. <laughs> I, I will say that the difference between Steve Clark and, and the fellow who played is, is pretty significant. And Jeff Attenella. And Jeff Attenella. Um, the underlying numbers, and, and I know that you guys – your eyes kind of glaze over when I talk about expected goals on this show, but so I'll make it brief. But the underlying numbers for for Portland defensively all year um, have been terrible, like like worst in the league on expected goals against, um, and that's kind of carrying over from what we saw towards the end of last year. Um, and now they've lost by three or more goals. I think five times in 18 games on the season, uh, three times in the past eight games. In the first half of the year, you could write it write it off as um, the injuries and maybe just a little bit of rust getting into the season and the the team being kind of unsettled. They should be past that point. They're they're a veteran team. They were a championship team literally a year ago. Today, we were probably on this show talking about how the Timbers were clearly the best team at MLS's back. And that it just seems like a, a distant memory at this point. And I think there are two issues. One, as you mentioned, Gasman, um, they do not scramble well defensively. If you get them sort of off kilter at all, they just do not have the pieces on that back line who can do anything to slow an opposing attack down. Now, that's one. And two, is that they're scrambling all the time because their midfield is very poor at getting pressure to the ball. So teams are able to string together meaningful passes against them that sort of unbalances Portland. And in the past, it, like Diego Chara alone was enough to deal with all that. And Diego Chara is still one of the best defensive midfielders, ball winners, um, in this league, but he's not what he was three years ago. I'm not sure he even is what he was a year ago. Um, and that is taking a toll. So when they come up against a team as good in the attack as, as Seattle, Portland's going to look pretty bad. And that's what ended up happening. The mitigating, well, the silver lining is, is the return of Blanco. Because for 45 minutes, I would argue that even with all those defensive issues and even with the scoreboard being what it was, I, I thought Portland was clearly the better team in the first half. The difference in the first half was the goalkeepers. Like Stephen Cleveland was awesome in that first half for Seattle. And the, the young man from, from Portland was very much not. So I, I still feel like Portland have a not, or maybe too much in attack to end up missing the playoffs but they're just defensively, and it to me it really starts in that midfield. There is just such a massive gap between them and the teams that are at the top of the standings in the West. Now, I think getting Williamson back will right. help them a lot to that degree. I mean, they, they missed him for a long stretch with the national team, and then um, now he's been out. And so when you see Blanco coming back, I've, I've sort of held off from saying this is pan- time to panic for Portland, because I think we've had had that question a number of times now. Uh, And I can understand it after last night as well. Uh, But I I think he is such a big part of making the pieces around them better. Uh, Espria, who I think has actually been really good this season. He's been awesome. um, I think is probably in an ideal situation, um, more of a player you use off the bench um, and can help change a game later on. And I think now that maybe Blanco's getting healthy and that begins to be more of a possibility, a possibility with Nishkoda maybe coming back into the lineup. 
So I, I'm still holding out a little bit. And I think in these games, although the score was 6-2, to two, which honestly the way Seattle played was deserved in the quality of the goals, but I do think that it it – it, these games can turn on you really quickly. And those couple little mistakes in the back, and I, and I hate to point to the goalkeeper, but I think in this case, the fourth goal, especially from Ivicic, Ivicic um, I think he, like that, re, giving up that rebound for uh, Rui Diaz was, was one that you can't quite get back because then next thing you know, it's one and then the next. Um, and, and I just think those little tiny margins where you saw, um, Cleveland be able to ho- hold on to the ball and be ball secure um, was was a big big difference between the two sides and um, it's not to point the finger at him but I, I think in those matches you know those little things it can ru- in either of these games either anytime these two teams play it can turn quickly one way or the other and in a hurry and I, I think we saw Seattle get on the good side of that. By the way, if we're not talking about Cleveland as a starting goalkeeper somewhere next year, I will be absolutely shocked because he has been immense for this team and if you look at Seattle like Steph Steph Fry is about to come back and he still looks like he's years away from retirement or he did before the injury I I have no reason to think that that'll be different Um, but they also have in in Andrew Thomas um, who they picked up via one some mechanism (laughs) or another I don't remember exactly Um, like he is one of the best young goalkeepers in the American player pool um, so they have the, and of course, Spencer Ritchie, who I think is a very reliable backup. So they have this, it, it, with what Steph Cleveland has done over the past few months, and especially in a game like this one, um, anybody who needs a goalkeeper this offseason, I imagine will be, you know, calling up Garth Lagerway and, and seeing if a deal can be done because the kid has been that good. And we saw it in, in this game because if he wasn't um, superb in that first half, we're talking about Portland going into the break up 3-2 instead of down 2-1. Uh, Anders in the chat mentioned Charlotte. Come on down. Obviously, Tyler Miller was the backup to, uh, right. to Stefan Fry in LAFC when it got him. And now he's the starter for Minnesota United as well. Um, I wanted to finish off on this and connect it to another one of the good games this weekend. Raul Reed Diaz. Dart- now- Dartmouth kid is, is uh, Cleveland, right? Yeah, and Dartmouth think- then Louisville. Yeah, and then Edwards was a... Uh, Northwestern, so they're going after the, the smart kids in, in goal, <laughs> which is not usually the route I would take. Uh, but wait a minute, hey. Steph Fry, Cal is a goal. And Brickley, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I got a yes. He, whoa, whoa, wait, no, no, he only mentioned good schools. We didn't, he didn't want to talk uh, about Cal. Uh, right, that was right, Kalen's right, decision right, to right. make. Uh, but now I'm going to move on to Raul Ruiz Diaz, who went back into the golden boot lead after this one. The free kick, I don't know that I've ever seen a person hit a free kick like that. It looked like he was hitting a ball that was rolling across him, the way he put it off the side of his foot. He's got 13 goals. And so we want to talk about his MVP push. And then Anders at the same time on Twitter this weekend put out a poll about Daniel Shallowy's MVP push, a 2-0 win for SKC. So I guess the League's Cup thing is fine because they beat Dallas, whatever, Peter. I don't really care. (laughs) Uh, So they get that 2-0 win, a little revenge for them after losing to Dallas two weeks ago. And Shallowy as well continues to put up numbers. I think many people had anointed Carlos Heel as the MVP. He is now out hurt. Do Rui Diaz and Shallowy have a pathway or a likelihood of being able to push into this convo? I mean, if if Carlos Heel stays hurt and we don't know for sure because the Revs are not giving uh, away much in terms of what the injury is actually is let alone a timeline um so we don't we don't really know even though it's been reported um nothing official if he'll stay her then it stands to reason that somebody from either seattle or uh sporting kc is going to be the mvp and it's usually i mean it's usually the guy who scores more goals so <laughs> Rui diaz would have the would have the advantage i think um and then for Shallowy, he he's been best eleven caliber this year. He has been absolutely fantastic. He's I an would MLS argue All Star Wednesday, yeah, August twenty fifth, nine PM Eastern time. I would argue that he's not even the team MVP. Like he's he's very very good. Uh, I mean he's excellent, but I I think Polito when he plays elevates the Sporting to just an absolutely different level in attack. Um, and then 
but the actual MVP of that team has been Fontas. When Fontas plays, their defense has been superb. When he doesn't play, well, we saw what happened in the League's Cup. So it's, I mean, to me, if Heal comes back, he's probably going to waltz to, to, you know, maybe not a unanimous, but something close to it. Um, if he doesn't, then Rui Diaz has the edge for sure. You you touched on it for me, though, for him in terms of the push and the narrative and all that is he has helped them stay afloat without Pulido, who's been out for a ton of the time. He's now back. So if they push towards the supporter shield while heels out, I don't know that it will look like Daniel Shallowy is carrying them because Pulido is back and what he's able to do to affect the attack. But unreal season for Daniel Shallowy. So congrats to him. Uh, let's finish out our chaos moments with mine which is Nashville, D.C., 5-2. D.C. scores a minute and a half into this game. Credit to the legend, Oso Ben Bear, who texted us like 20 minutes before this game, and he's like, I think this game might be lit. And then it was 3-2 at <laughs> halftime to Nashville. Uh, Dax McCarty, as I said, his 400th career MLS game, gets messages from a bunch of legends, a bunch of people he played with, including Bastian Schweinsteiger, who won a World Cup for the Chicago Fire. Obviously a huge moment for him. And for Nashville, it was like, they go down 1-0, and you're back into the, wow, Nashville keeps playing from behind. Game states, they're, if they're going to drop more home points, this is a team in trouble. And then you end the night with, this is a juggernaut. This is an <laughs> untouchable team in Major League <laughs> Soccer. We just interviewed Hernan Losada. We played him up. We played them up. And then they went and put them to the sword and just dominated all over. CJ Sapon gets two more goals, so the DPs are unnecessary off the bench. And... Uh, Jamie Watson talked about it all game. The confidence Hani Mukhtar is playing with. He is a different player for them. He is comfortable. He is happy. And they're a different team when he's able to pull strings like that. You you missed the most chaotic part of this night. The, so the early goal was Frederick Briant getting like really good run and header on a corner to, to get in front of the defender and uh, head it back post. And, you know, he celebrates and everything. And, like 30 seconds later, Nashville's down the other end attacking and the, the D.C. defense is, is all screwed up. And the goalkeeper, John Kempen, who had a nightmare, yeah. comes out and Briant is there to head a, like, had a shot clear right off the line. And then like uh, Nashville get the rebound, cycle it around a bit. And as Briant, Briant had like dove into the net as he was heading that ball off the line. And as he's like, you know, coming out of the goal, like coming out of the net and like running back into the play, Nashville have another shot that he clears off the line. He scored a goal and prevented a goal twice in the span of like 45 seconds. It was absolutely. And like when that happened, it was like, DC is going to win this one two nil because this is going to like emotionally crush yeah. Nashville from having that sequence of events open their home game and you know playing from behind for the seventh time this year and obviously as you you know later pointed out um that's not the way it played out. Yeah, I think hey, one uh, of those shots was from Alistair Johnson, uh, who was unlucky not to get a goal. And he's had a couple of cleared off the line in, in the yeah, past I couple don't weeks. And he hasn't scored a pro goal yet. Really? Oh, but yeah. he's but like what, what I think when I watch Nashville play, though, one thing that really and why I think CJ Sapong has been such a great fit for them is their wide play has been really good. And they have got really good service in the box. Leal, I think, has the cross on the first one um, where he, he can kind of drift out to the right hand side. You see Mukhtar off, often uh, moving over to the left side. They've got um, just like good wing play and they're getting balls in the box. And, you know, CJ Sapong can get up and bang them in. And when you add that confidence to it, and then you have this balance of like, okay, now you need to worry and collapse on Sapong, but then you've got Mokhtar who can kind of get out wide and he gets isolated one-on-one -on -one, starts ca causing problems as well too. And so this Nashville team, I think we had this idea of them that they were just a team that was going to maybe defend and use set pieces to get goals. Not at all. That's not what's happening. No. No. That's not, that's not this Nashville SC team. And I, and I, I think you're right. The confidence within the group is there, but I really do. I think you hit it right on the head. And and uh, Watson did during the broadcast was uh, Hani Mukhtar just looks like at times he, he's throwing step overs. He's he's setting up players. His service has been good. And there are times where he's been dangerous in the past. Right. He's always kind of had that little bit of flair to his game, but it hasn't really consistently turned to goals or assists. 
now that's starting to happen um, and happen in a big way. And his his relationship with Sapong, I think, has been really key for them. Sapong occupies the he's always been so good at this, occupying defenders and just using his, his strength and his technique to not just hold the ball up and, and you know be a problem for the the guy on his back, but actually to to compress the entire defense because once he has a guy on his back, the other like help is required. You have to come over. And he's been able to to use that skill set to get Hani Mukhtar and Lial to a lesser extent into a ton of space. And Mukhtar on top of that is playing more as a second forward now. It, it's not his response. He's wearing the 10, but it's like an old fashioned Number 10, we think of the 10 in a lot of ways as the guys who are, you know, in central midfield kind of running the show and pulling the strings. And he was not suited to doing that. And now he has less responsibility for that and more responsibility to find space, find chances, create chances, be a creature of the final third. Um, and, and Sapong has freed him up to do that. And as you said, David, he's keeping two DP center forwards on the bench, like Ake Loba. He's coming off the bench now. Jandra Cadiz didn't even make the bench for this game. CJ Spong, I think 80 career goals, um, some of the best hold-up play in the league. He was a free agent. He was a free agent this past winter. Any team in the league could have had him. He obviously landed in the right sp- in the right spot, but like th- there got to be GMs around MLS kicking themselves <laughs> for not realizing what he could do for their team. Uh, for Nashville, I think his second goal was an 18 pass sequence yep. that went from sideline to sideline. So it, you talk about playing from behind. That's an issue. Game States creates these situations, but they got to one, one and they continue to open up and play. And then two, one and three, one uh, when Ola scored at three, two, which was a gorgeous ball from Paul Ariola over the top. And I thought Ola impressive to not stab at it with his head, but to let it come through to his uh, foot. That's when I thought, uh oh, this is going to be like 3 3 and Nashville's going to be yep. frustrated. I want to give one last shout out. I don't really know what to call it. Alex Muriel comes off the bench, scores a goal, makes it 4 2. It feels like the game's over. Then he draws a penalty. And Ake Loba, your multi million dollar DP, comes off the bench and Alex Muriel takes the penalty. And I, I assume Gary Smith didn't say anything. And why would he at that point of the game? But you think that's a chance to get him a goal. What yeah. Alex Muriel. Took control of the situation and banged it home. Credit to him. Uh, so Nashville continues on in what has been a bizarre streak, but they are now one of the top teams in the league. We're going to get to a few of our tiers and how we feel about these teams, but I want to close out on one last uh, Sunday game before we get to our celebrating soccer moment. And this one's for Weeby. He's out. We feel for him. The father's back. Orlando! And whatever else he would say 15 times. <laughs> Uh, Joseph Martinez, his first goal at Mercedes Bank Stadium or Mercedes Bank Stadium. Whoa. Mercedes <laughs> Benz Stadium in Atlanta in two years, which was awesome. A 1 0 win over LAFC. Uh, and I think Doyle is just exciting to see him get that goal. Barco's pass, the fans in the stadium. I couldn't see most of it because of the sun, but uh, I assume it was really impressive. And it just. This feels like an emotional moment that Atlanta needs to move forward under Gonzalo Pineda. I mean, it, it was clearly an emotional moment for like, like a cathartic moment, you know, like, like an exhale because this is not, I mean, Joseph's got five goals in about 750 minutes this year, which is an elite goal scoring rate um, in this league. He now has three in his last three appearances, which is obviously huge, but the way this happened with him, getting out into transition, moving really well. He's still not moving 100%. He doesn't look like the the pre-ACL Joseph. Um, but he was there there was there was more zip to his game and then just being ruthless when he's in that spot. Um, it felt like a it felt like a significant step back towards being the Atlanta that uh, was so much fun and from 2017 to 2019 who were always looking to get out into transition. And it's, I mean, Atlanta fans are overjoyed to hear Gonzalo Pineda praise the way the team has performed under Rob Valentino, because the team has frankly been much more fun and much better under Rob Valentino um, than they were under Gabriel Heinz or honestly, Frank DeBoer. Um, 
and, and Pineda said, I'm not actually planning to change much. I like the way they've played under Rob. And if you look at the way the Sounders played when Pineda was a top assistant, it makes sense. The Sounders are all about being good on the ball, but they use that skill on the ball to be a devastating transition team. That's what this Atlanta team is, is actually built for, not the type of positional play that we've seen attempts uh, over the past two, two and a half years. Yeah, the only thing I'd add, best thing that you could say about it was the shot clock from start to finish. The throw, By the time the ball comes in on the throw-in, 12 seconds till the ball hits the back of the net. When we saw That's Atlanta right. United in, in past, that kind of hypercharged energy is where you're going to be able to get, and direct play is going to get Joseph in positions where once he gets on the move and gets ahead of steam, it's hard to get an eye on him, hard track. I mean, give it also, I think Moreno's got the uh, uh, little Meg that was pretty dirty to, to start the whole thing off. But 12 seconds, I'm not saying that's going to happen all the time, but it's a good underlying number to, uh, to keep an eye on. Rob Valentino entering Connor Kaser territory of just did as an interim unreal numbers and just move on from there. They're both potential hall of famers with the record that they put up as coaches in their short time. Uh, let's move to my favorite moment of the weekend. Bobby Wood, the game winner for RSL against Austin FC, our celebrating soccer moment of the weekend presented by continental tire, Bobby Wood. He struggled with injuries. His club situation has been chaos. It's about three years now for him where he just hasn't been able to enjoy the game. He talked about wanting to be here, wanting to be, a part of this family, get playing time. We're going to have an interview coming up with him in just a moment. But Kalen, he scores the go-ahead goal, runs to the corner. Basically, three generations of women in his family are there to cheer him on, and he's able to celebrate with his young daughter. This was just cool to see. Yeah, it was awesome. It was, it's gotten some good uh, pickup and attention, which uh, is deserved because, uh, you know, just going through a tough time. I think we've all been through a tough time, not being around family much and uh, seeing his family now coming back to the U.S. and getting this fresh, clean slate in Salt Lake um, and then having them all at his match uh, to score a goal and go over and celebrate with them was really awesome moment definitely worthy of celebrating and uh he took his chance well and it was a big result for salt lake who i believe now are sixth in the in the west so right in a really good spot um to be this late in the season and um we've seen them sort of have to fight their way in the past or be hovering right around it and this pushes them a little bit further to feel a little bit more secure about their playoff space it's what we've seen him do best in his career, finding space in the box, being a pure finisher, showing his strength, and then to bounce it down, that little bit of creativity in the goal. But for more on that, let's talk to the man himself. We uh, spoke with Bobby Wood a little bit earlier today. All right, and now let's get to our AT&T 5G call to the field. And who else? After a weekend like this, after what I tweeted out was the best goal celebration combo of the year, we had to have on RSL's own Bobby Wood. Bobby, thanks for taking the time. Thank you for having me. So take us into Saturday night. You walk out on the field after everything you've been through over the last two, three years, mm -hmm. you know, not playing injuries, being away from home. You walk out on the field in the starting lineup in front of your family. Yeah. What's going through your head? Yeah, I was just uh, kind of nervous, but it was just nice to have my family there. And, you know, it was a exciting game for me. It just it was awesome to be able to play in front of them. So you get the goal, beautiful goal, beautiful header, and then the celebration. Did you know that you were going to run to your family? Walk us through all that. Uh, I mean, I really wanted to score for my daughter because it was her first game uh, seeing me live. And I don't know, it was just uh, it just kind of happened. Uh, like it was just a reaction, I guess you could say. And I saw them and took advantage of them being right there by the field. I know times have been weird lately. You haven't been able to see family as much as we would all like to. Was this their first RSL game? Yes, uh, this was their first RSL game. You know, um, it was the first time my grandma saw me live and my mom's first game in, uh, at Salt Lake and my wife's first game. So it was, it was good to have my sister's first game. So, yeah, it was good to have them all there. Wait, so your daughter's first game, but also your grandma's first game, and she doesn't yeah. get a kiss on the goal celebration? <laughs> Come <Yeah>. on. <laughs> Not that much time, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, she came from Japan, so it was good to have her here. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a good feeling. I, I know you're from Hawaii. Um, what, what are some early memories of, of growing up playing soccer there? Um, what, what was that like? 
Uh, just like chilling, having a 10 out on the field, staying there all day, playing like two, three games a day, uh, eating pokey and spam musubis for lunch and breakfast. And that's basically it. <laughs> uh, it's, it was cool. I mean, it was just the total different vibe than it, than it is, I think, on the main island. And yeah, it was it was just uh, different, I guess. It's just an island life, and it's hard to explain unless you kind of grew up with it. I know that there's been a number of players who have come from Hawaii, actually, um, and some young guys coming through USL, and I think the Sounders have a connection there as well, too. Um, I guess, wh- why do you think... What do you think is special about the Hawaiian player or is unique that has allowed, you know, from such a small set of islands to come through and get all the way to the national team and um, play, you, you played abroad? And um, what, what do you think it is that makes the Hawaiian player unique? It's hard to say. I mean, I don't there's I wouldn't say there's a lot of us coming out of Hawaii just because the opportunity, it's it's hard to get out. But um I think the island's doing pretty good for what we got. And, um, you know, we just have to kind of, I think everyone just has to work hard. And, you know, if everyone works hard, then I think they can get out of it. So Hawaii to Salt Lake City, they are slightly different Mm -hmm. in temperature and climate and geography as well. Um, What's been the initial experience so far in Salt Lake? I think the altitude, it's been... The first month or so was pretty hard to get used to. It was just the heat, you know, it was just completely different than what I've kind of, I've never lived in an environment that was like, I guess, this intense. So it took a, a while getting used to, but I, I think I've adapted adapted pretty good now. And um, yeah, I think just the altitude and heat. What, what made you, you choose uh, Salt Lake? What, what what drew you to the opportunity and ultimately your decision? I think just the vibe that the club gives out. You know, they. I wanted to come to a place where it felt very tight-knitted and the group, you know, the group of guys were very tight. And that's kind of what they, they told me to expect. And, you know, my expectations have been through the roof so far you know that the team has been amazing the coaching staff have been amazing the everyone the staff and you know it's been it's a real tight-knit group and it's exactly what i wanted to come to and uh i'm grateful that i have the opportunity to be at this club so when you decided that you were going to leave hamburg was it you wanted to come to mls was it let's look at the offers out there how did the, your process and this move come come to be you know i think Mentally, I, I I was ready to come home. You know, I was in Germany for 14 years. And, you know, I've since 14, I kind of just, I've seen my mom and family once a year. So just mentally, I was ready to come home, you know, having a second daughter. I just, it, it just felt right to come home and, you know, have my family grow up here and uh, be closer to my family and, you know, just kind of be closer to family, have a home feeling, and just mentally I was ready for that. What is the thought process, because now we see a ton of young players going over to Europe, Yeah. about what the move from Europe to MLS means and, and mm-hmm. what it can do for your career and, and your perception of this league before you ever got here? For, for, honestly, it's the what I thought about this league is kind of what, yeah, it. Well, how, how do I say it? Like, what I thought about this league is true. You know, it's an athlete's league. Everyone's fit. Everyone's strong. Everyone's crazy fast, and it's a up and down game. And it's difficult in its own way. It's a completely different style of play than in Germany, but it's still extremely hard. You know, um, I think the league is has grown so much with fans, the stadiums, the training facilities. It's it's crazy how how uh, how great everything has been here. And, you know, the leagues, like I said, it's extremely difficult. And I think people that come from Europe or wherever, when they start playing in this league, they're, I think everyone's kind of shocked at how high the level is, you know, the individual qualities 
and stuff like that. So uh, that's just something that, yeah, it's it's been fun playing in a different league, and it's just been exciting to experience something new now. We, we've seen a big influx of young players developing in MLS, um, mm-hmm. some going abroad and getting their opportunities there too. Is, yeah. there, is there anybody that's maybe caught your attention, uh, I guess specifically from the Salt Lake program that, that you think is, you say has a big future, or, you know, might get that t- type of attention? I think I've been here a little bit too short to see like the youth players because um, because of COVID, everything's kind of separated right now. So a lot of the younger players haven't been training as much probably as I think the club normally would like to, but just the league in general, you know, a couple of years ago, I don't, everyone kind of didn't look at the MLS as a, a crazy development league, but now you got everyone looking for the, at the MLS for that new young talent. And I think you see that every, every transfer window, you know, you got all these scouts and, all these players looking at the MLS now. And it's exciting to see the, the, for example, the national team, how many young players there are just balling in the, in the top leagues. And, you know, uh, a lot of the MLS players doing well as, as, as well. And, um, you know, it's, it's really cool to see how, how much the league and the national team, the youth development has, has developed. It's, 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 it's exciting. It's really cool. You led the way. Now we're pumping players into German youth teams. <laughs> and now it all starts to flourish. Uh, I want to I ask you about RSL, though, and, mm-hmm. and what this team can be. Because, honestly, the outside expectations from a lot of people around the country and you know around the region mm-hmm. aren't that high. But yes. this club's in the playoff spots halfway through the season. Mm-hmm. And the, the one thing I get when I watch you guys play is you just never quit. And it yeah. sounds simple, but it seems to work for you what can this rsl team be this year yeah i mean we have high potential you know i think we have a great group of guys you know the mentality is it's all there everyone's fit everyone's everyone's there mentally you know we got a hard working team you know everyone from top to bottom just wants to work hard and you know i think it's a process of just building that even you know more and more and uh, as the season goes on, hopefully we'll be able to build, you know, a step at a time. And uh, for me, I think the we have a very strong team and, you know, I, I don't think we should be, uh, you know, looked down on as much as a lot of people do, maybe. I don't, though. I don't. Yeah. Everyone else. They're, <laughs> they're the ones making the mistake. Uh, take me into a locker room with Freddie Juarez. He's a young mm-hmm. manager, but... He seems to have a connection with this club. You've obviously mainly worked under German and European managers. What have you seen from how he operates and, and, you know, how the club's been built? Yeah. I mean, I, when I had a, when I had a talk with him, he was one of the main reasons why I came, you know, he, he made me feel comfortable and I haven't had a, I haven't had that coach player uh, bond in a while. You know, he's so honest. He, he tells it like it is, Um, you know, he's not, trying to control everyone and, you know, be some type of dictator or anything like that. He, he lets the players kind of, you know, he shows a lot of trust in players, but he also expects that same respect back. And, you know, I think he's done a very good job of finding that balance between uh, showing a lot of respect and, you know, trusting a lot of players and everything like that. So it's been very, it's been very nice to have that type of uh, coach at, at this club and, you know, um, I think the the team is feels the same way. You know, it, it shows when we fight. Maybe we don't play as as good as we should sometimes, but you know, everyone's everyone's fighting, and I think that shows a lot uh, within the squad. No, it's super important to be in a good situation. You mentioned the sort of trust of the manager and the environment around you, and then most importantly getting minutes and getting goals and confidence for a striker is everything. Mm -hmm. Um, Is the national team still something that is a part of your goals? And have you had any conversations with, um, with the Federation? No, I mean, I haven't talked to the Federation in a while, but you know, it's, it's not surprising. I haven't played in a while. So, you know, with the high level talent that the national team has now, it's, it's not anything I expected or it's, something I expected not to be in contact, but you know, right now for me, it's, 
it's always an honor to play with the national team. But right now, like I said, it's it's all about RSL. You know, I think I just need to do my thing here. And, you know, once I make that step and get that flow, you know, we can look forward to maybe playing with the national team again. But for now, it's I'm just going to concentrate on getting my form back, playing as much as I can and uh, just having fun again. You mentioned you haven't been playing those games. It was your spot as the starting center forward for the national team and then not getting those minutes over the last few years. Do you have any regrets or disappointments with maybe the way things went for you in Germany and the way this has all played out? Yeah. I mean, you never want to just, you know, be in a tough situation. But, you know, there was a lot of things outside of soccer that was happening at, at the club I was at. And, um, you know, it's something that, was tough. I obviously it wasn't an easy time, but you know, I grew as a person and you know, I don't I don't regret anything that's happened to me. You know, even though there were a lot of tough situations, it, it made it helped me grow uh mentally and um, uh, you know, there's nothing I regret about it. It just I look at it as a lesson and, you know, I move I moved on from it. You know, I I look at it as a lesson and, you know, it it, it happened and that's just how it is now. I would assume from your national team time and being in Europe that you knew Rubio Rabin before you got to Salt Lake. Is that true? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, he was, when was it? He played in, he was at a London camp with me a while ago. He was crazy young. He was, you know, Rubio's always had that talent really. Um, but you know, he's had a tough path as well. And he's a amazing player for me. He's, extremely underrated i think people need to put a little bit more respect on his name sometimes because he can do a lot and i think the future for him is extremely bright he's a hard-working hungry guy and you know it's it's nice to see someone that's been through so much you know come back up again and show what he can do and uh uh hopefully we'll be able to play together a little bit. I was more. about to ask. <laughs> so what is, are you guys battling it out for a spot? Does that make you better? Do you enjoy watching it? Yeah, I mean, thing? At the end of the day, it's the coach's decision, but you know, we push each other every day, you know, um, he's a, he's a great player. You know, I know it, it sucks that right now it's, we're playing with one up top, but you know, think in football, things change all the time. And, you know, we're, we're both ready at, at, at any moment, you know? And um, like I said, he's an, amazing player uh hungry talented has a lot of qualities and uh you know i would love to get a chance to play with him one day and uh well we'll see so i want to close you out on a guy you do get to play with but could also literally play anywhere i'm pretty sure demir krylock mm -hmm. would score goals if you put him yeah. in goal if he wanted to what is this guy great at and how many does he bang in in training because he scores from every spot on the field yeah. in games yeah, I mean, he's Dami. He he's he's got a good uh he's got a good nose for the goal, I guess you could say. He especially with crosses and stuff, he's always in that right spot. And um, you know, we gotta use that as as good as possible. So it's good to find a balance of what his position is, what his best position is on the field. Well, we're looking forward to watch him do his thing in the all star game in about a week and a half and RSL yeah. to continue on Wednesday night against the Houston Dynamo. This has been Bobby Wood, goal scorer this weekend, father of the year right now. At least for now, you got to keep scoring every time your daughter shows up. Bobby, thanks for taking the time. Congrats, thanks for me. Take care. Thanks so much to Bobby Wood once again for joining us. Excited to see him do his thing now. It was cool to hear him talk about Rubio Rubin, that level of respect, pushing each other. Freddie, he said you're open and honest. He wants to play up top with his boy. Let's see the Rubin. <laughs> let's see the Rubin Wood front line. Although, I, again, maybe you throw Carlac behind them, and then you just got goal scorers everywhere. Have Aaron Herrera bombing balls uh, from deep for them. Uh, last thing on this game, I have to say, and we are not instant replay, so you can go hear what Charlie thinks about this. The Julio Cascante red red card was one of the worst I've seen Oof. in a very long time, uh, and I, I know Josh Wolf agrees, which is not really great support for me because he's a bit biased in the moment. But bizarre one uh, to see go down. Congratulations, though. RSL deserved to win. They've. I I was hoping this would be a corner that they're going to turn and push to the playoffs. So good start for them again. Houston Dynamo they have on Wednesday night, full midweek of uh, slate of games. We'll obviously hit all of that. Only Coming thing up I'll add real quick, what I liked from Bobby's interview and and just talking to about 
the type of player RSL is going for is they're going for guys that are looking that have maybe a little bit of a chip on their shoulder or have, you know, are really trying to find their way back into form. Um, and when you talked about kind of like that never give up attitude, I, I feel like they've from a personality or uh, a pro player profile perspective, they've got a pretty good clear idea of uh, the type of guy they want to go after and, and it seems to be working. You're going to send them your, your resume. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I have fallen a little too far, I think. Sadly. Oh, I mean, man. Yeah. Hey, look, we get you into that altitude. It takes that little bit of pressure off the Yeah, knees. when he said it altitude, I was like, world. oh. Yeah, I forgot about that. No thanks. Uh, so let's jump into some final few games and some final few teams. Doyle, you put out your tiers column last week, revisiting what you did in mm-hmm. preseason of how these 27 clubs in MLS break out. MLS Cup contenders have enough talent not there yet need maybe one more piece. Let's start with one of your tier two teams, which was the LA Galaxy. They get an unbelievable win at Minnesota. Jonathan Klinsman, ridiculous performance, has not played a ton over the last year and a half. (laughs) Jonathan Klinsman's a rec league guy? Berkeley Berkeley guy. Another The Berkeley goalkeeper pipeline is strong. So anyways, continue. Yeah, well, it helps because they can't score goals over the last 15 (laughs) years. So (laughs) they kind of need it. Um, Jovicic as well gets the start. Uh, with Chicharito out. And to me, Doyle, their ability to continue to get results without Chicharito pushes them into that tier one because they are no longer reliant on one piece who is an MVP candidate when healthy. So I I think that is the argument. And and I'm not there yet. I know, I I, made the argument. I I still still think they're a a tier two team. Um, Cabral scored a wonderful goal Mm -hmm. in this game. And like... That goal, in a lot of ways, is emblematic of, of how Greg Vanny wants his team to play. It, the, you know, passes that cut out multiple defenders, getting to players on the run, um, wingers playing sort of outside in. It was like they're very good at that, and they need Cabral and Grancier or one of the other young wingers. Um, you know, maybe it's Cameron Dunbar if he, he starts getting more minutes to be goal dangerous. And they like they really haven't been this year. Like even they've managed to, to put together some results without Chicharito, but so much of it has come down to can the, can the center for forward score. Um, the fact that this game didn't uh, and the fact that they were, I think clearly the better team for about 75 minutes on the road at a very good Minnesota United side that had one loss in their previous 15, I want to say, or maybe 13 um, is, I mean, it was it was a statement win, but I'm still not like if you watch that Galaxy game and then you watch the level that the Timbers or the the Sounders played at against the Timbers or what New England's done over the past five months, um, you know, with the what Sporting have done, even in the face of injuries and missing guys to the Gold Cup and selling their D mid to a Serie A club for ten million dollars, I just think I still think the Galaxy are a cut below that, um, which is not to say that they can't, you know, make it to MLS Cup and maybe win their first trophy of the Tam era, um, but I. I'm still comfortable with them in tier two. The fact so, that we're even having this conversation though yeah, is yeah. pretty incredible, right? I mean, any it's other, any 16th, other year, 2021, any other year, any other year we would have Greg Vanny as like the runaway coach. Lock. Yeah, and yeah. all those other co- all those other coaches and clubs you mentioned are sporting Kansas City. We we're at the top of the Western Conference last year. Seattle, who's perennially there, uh, New England, who's emerged. You know, so it's kind of like the fact that we're even that they're even right on that. Edge is right where I think Vanny wants to see his team. Um, and I think even I think as they as they head towards the playoffs, if they get a fresh Chicharito back who's, you know, eager to get back into the team and starts running again, and then you have all these other guys that have gotten minutes and they've strengthened the team as well, too. Um Cabral's gonna need to have some moments too if they're gonna go if they're gonna go deep and find a playoffs because at some point. I understand that Chicharito is is the main guy and it's going to go through him. But when we've seen teams in the past in the playoffs who, who go far and win, Seattle, Toronto in the past, you have to find secondary options as well. You have to be able to find a secondary score or somebody that can help get an important goal or a clutch goal or set piece or whatever it might take. Um, so to have some, they have got some pretty dynamic options. So in some ways, the fact that they're getting results now without Chicharito 
will give these players a little bit, tell Vanny a little bit more of who he can trust and who he can't trust and how he can use guys even when Chicharito does get back involved as they head down the stretch run. It's been a good few weeks for the LA Galaxy, especially with the moves they've been able to make. Let's look at our 22 under 22 player of the weekend presented by Body Armor, which goes into our tier three team from your article, Doyle, that mm-hmm. I wanted to talk about. Cole Bassett gets an assist in the win versus Houston, played at wing back in this one. Austin Trusty at left wing back, him at right wing back, which didn't think I was going to be saying that in preseason. Uh, Colorado are now fourth in the Western Conference, and they have two games in hand pretty much on everyone around them. Do you guys still feel that they are a tier three team, or is this a rapid team that needs to be in an MLS Cup Supporter Shield conversation? I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm going to leave the tiers up to. Uh, and, and the other thing, too, is it's hard to read too much into, sadly, wins against my Dynamo right now. I think we're 12 <laughs> games on without a win at this point. So it's been pretty, pretty brutal for, for Houston. Um, the thing I like about this Colorado team is the kind of wealth of options. Now, maybe this is also a double-edged sword yeah. uh, because they, I, when you look at the tier one teams, you are seeing players emerge as the go-to guy who's going to get you goals. And then you start asking questions of who's the secondary option in Colorado. And this is no like diss on them, but it seems like a number, they have a wealth of, number two options right as opposed to having one single striker sometimes they get goals off barrio sometimes they get goals off shinyashiki sometimes and they've found timely goals to get results which which bodes well um i just do wonder as you get to i guess now i've found my way back into the tier system but is is you (laughs) there's no escape the doyle tears uh (laughs) <laughs> tears yeah that's right yeah. Um, but anyways it's yeah. crying that's what we're <laughs> that too. yeah there's no escaping that um yeah I, I i think that that might be the only argument to say that they're still a notch or two below the very top but um they're gonna there, there is an argument in the doyle winning an mls playoffs that uh being good at set pieces is an elite category it, for sure no it's it, and and they're pretty good at that they have, they're great on set pieces they have one of uh, the best defenses in the league. Robin Frazier has done some amazing work changing you know, formation, mm-hmm. uh, shifting players around into spots where they can be better. Um, I think, honestly, adjusting the principles of play because, like, uh, you know, Eunice Nomley was supposed to be the man for them this year and he got hurt right away. And without, they just don't have a central midfielder with that type of creative vision. Um, and and so the team is really oriented towards getting Barrios in behind, and they've been really good at that. And like that checks a lot of boxes. They're a really solid team. This is their ceiling. Like if they went into a playoff game against Seattle or Sporting KC or uh, LA, that it's Rui Diaz, Pulido, and Chicharito. Like Colorado has Diego Rubio, and we've seen this for for twenty five years now. The, the team with the better center forward is always going to be the favorites in, in the playoffs. You need that guy. Colorado doesn't have that guy. Now, the caveat here is that while the trade and transfer window is still open, um, the rosters aren't locked. You can still make signings for guys who are free agents. And there are a number of free agent center forwards available around the world. Um Colorado have two open DP slots. Their cap is nice and clean. So if they want to make a, a signing like that, they can do it. Um, but if they don't, like I think this is, you know, a top four team in the West is probably about as high as this group can climb. Oh, right, speaking of that, let me close you out on our mailbag. Tyler from Kentucky says, with the transfer window dust settling, is there any glaring within leagues deals that could have been made that would have benefited both clubs? Example, getting a guy off the books, filling a need. Was there any big one? That you thought, and these are no's from both of you. No, you cut out. <laughs> you're you're, oh. gl- you're glitching out. Yeah, you're glitching out. Uh, okay. Were there any? Were there any that you saw? Because like, there's none. I mean, in in retrospect, if you're if you're Austin, you you probably would have wanted to call. Uh, Nashville about Daniel Rios. I think Daniel Rios is a starting center forward in this league. Um, mm-hmm. And he's, what, fourth on the depth? Well, third now because Cadiz doesn't even make the doesn't even make the, the game day roster. But I, I would have 
made that call. Like Austin getting a center forward is, is a big one, a big and obvious one to me. Yeah, I think that makes a ton of sense. I thought Jan Gregus would go somewhere in the league because I think he has talent, and I don't think Minnesota wants to carry his contract if they're not playing him. I don't have a landing spot for him specifically. That makes a ton of sense. And Houston, Karaskia looks like a really good pickup just from one game in. So if that was the team, it doesn't make a ton of sense for them. Um, But thanks to Tyler in Kentucky for the question. Thank you guys for taking the time to join me here today. Uh, Andrew Weeby will be back on Thursday. He will lead with 37 minutes about NYCFC because he took that part of the of the rundown and he took it with him. So we just didn't know what to talk about. We couldn't find it. But uh, Tati Castellano is continuing to do things just specifically to spite Matt Doyle when he gets the opportunity, if he can. Uh, I'm David Goss, Kalen Carr, Matt Doyle. Thanks so much for joining us and have a good rest of your week. Enjoy some midweek MLS action. And we'll, of course, be back on Thursday. So you made it through and even enjoyed more than an hour of MLS talk with extra time driven by Continental Tire. That means that you should go subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to them. And you should also check out more extra time on the MLS YouTube channel. If I can uh, point right there, yeah, click right there and subscribe to the MLS channel right here. Have a great day, folks.